I would be interested in knowing what you think of the videos because they're, it's now above the head camera, an iPhone SE, and I can see what it's doing in this mirror, hence the reason when the mirror is screwed to the ceiling. So I can actually switch it on and focus it and get it in position through that convex mirror. So I'd be interested in knowing what you think of it. Well, looky, looky, looky. We have a very old guitar. And we don't know what make it is, but it's a very old guitar. And it is, looks like, I don't actually think it's a half size guitar. I think it's like a parlor guitar, acoustic parlor guitar. It has a lot of damage. That's actually a split going down it. Now, I wanted to. I wanted to leave it as it is and just fix it and gloss it up and leave the scratches and but the owner wants to get it looking better. I don't know what those scratches are or something, but also the owner had scratched some things there when he was young and he just wants them cleaned up in a way. So as you can see, it's quite delicate and old. Maybe Maybe the bridge might be lifted there a little bit, but I'm not going to know that until I get into the uh, actual workings. It has a neck that can be removed, and it shall be removed. It's got a special bolt in there, and I haven't looked at the tuners. They feel, mm, they feel okay-ish. The neck looks like it might have a little bit of weakness there i'm not known until i take it off and we have a piece of paper in there which we'll get to in a second and it scratches and scores all around there's nothing really major broken on it uh, as you can see it looks pretty good but the neck does have a gap there so the piece of paper there is obviously for a reason so let's, oh, it's stiff. It's stiff for that piece of paper. Oh, oh, oh. I'm gonna need both hands so it'll come okay. okay. It's nothing, it's actually just a blank piece of paper. There's no hidden maps to treasure or anything on it. So that'll go in the bin. Okay. Uh, the neck and the frets all need to be done. It's been well played. Uh, frets are all pretty good. The neck itself is, uh, I haven't put the machine on it yet, but it looks pretty straight. I cut the strings off, by the way. I'll actually just stick the machine on it now. Hold on a second, where are you, machine? There you go. I'm sure that machine has a name, but I couldn't be bothered thinking about it. Oh, this looks like a weird fret. Let's just, oh, there we got it there. Okay, and you're looking at it with me as I'm looking at it. Uh, and it's looking okay. It doesn't have a, uh, a, a, a truss rod in it. So, but it's looking okay, but we can't do anything with it even if it wasn't looking okay. All right, without a whole lot of hassle. So that's a, now, it's a score down there, it's a score. Now, would you like to have a look inside? Ooh, the next, look, when I took the strings off on that piece of paper. I don't think I'm doing this properly so you can see it. So the piece of paper was holding the strings. Okay, let's have a nosy inside. Okay, okay. this is my new camera. We're going to have a nosy inside. I expect it to be black as a boot. Because this is a, again, I say it's a very old camera, but a very old camera. Very old guitar. Uh, my interest is in the stripes of the top. don't they? I can't see that. I'm going to have to look at it on the computer and then comment on it. Now let's look at the neck. See what on. Right, okay. I have a feeling I'm going to have to change that for a bolty bolt and a screwy bolt. But 
there. Look, the paper's there. Ooh, oh, right, okay, where are Oh, there we are. The paper's there, and I can't make anything out on it. It obviously was something at some time. Right, so when I go to fix this, I'll put another video on. That is the neck off. Uh, fairly fragile wood. I wouldn't want to be mean with it. I don't know what kind of wood it is. But uh, the top has got a little, another little bit of paper. There might be something on that. And that's the bolt. That's the bolt that goes through it. I couldn't find anything that matches that size. And then the other side has got, you saw that, it's got a bolt built into the wood. Whether I trust that or not, I don't know yet, but I'm going to look at it. Let's just have a look at that piece of paper to see if there's anything, the sinking of the Titanic or anything on it that might give us any clues to the age of this. Well, I'll just put this down. A housewife cheated is something. Something a housewife cheated. And on the other side, there's just a black bar. But so close. But I actually think that this was this is sort of like a sun type newspaper, so it would probably be uh, put in after well after the guitar was made to try and help it. So I'm sort of guessing. I guess this might be a 40s, early 50s guitar. Anybody got any other better guesses? I'd be glad to accept them. Okay. And lots of noise there. And I'd also be interested in knowing what you think that wood, what that wood is. The wood of the fretboard is different from the wood of the uh, neck. The wood of the neck looks like a uh, an oak or something. I don't think that's correct. I hope it's not correct, but it seems strong. If it's been glued back together, I'm going to let it be. Okay. Don't know what those scratches are. Anyway, I have all sorts of codes. And, uh, right, what I'm going to do is clean it all up now and see what I can do about this. Clean up this here and have a closer look at that. I see there's a, is that a brass, a brass saddle? Very, very low brass saddle. Saddle? Very posh. A very, very low brass saddle. It's, uh, as you see, it's not much there. It's almost like a red saddle. It's there. It's there. I don't think it needs to be changed. So, yeah, that's it cleaned up a little bit. Do you, is the light not good in here or is it just the light outside that's too bright? Let me just put this blind down here. Could maybe the blinds giving the wrong shadows across the way. Think, yeah, that's a bit more more clearer. And you can see it. I cleaned it up with a bit of paraffin. I wanted to see what the paraffin does to the body and it did nothing to it, unfortunately. <laughs> Would prefer. But oh, where's that bit of wood? Could you use that bit of wood? Yes, it's, yeah, it's only just that one corner. I do also think that looking at the strings, they were far too fat for it. I think looking at them, they were far too fat. I just pulled them out of the bin there. And they look too fat, so I think when I order new strings, I'll order some strings that are more suitable for it. Just having a closer look at this. There's actually three pieces of wood there. Yeah, three pieces. There's uh, the, the little joins in the wood is what you see. So they're not cracks, they're just glued together. So I'm going to do the fretboard now. I'm going to scrape it and polish it, check it for levels and everything. I'm just going to let the camera run and uh, do the whole thing. Because the neck is off the guitar, it, it's it going to tend to wobble a little bit, but I don't think it's going to make a big difference to it. It's a fairly inexpensive guitar. I don't think the neck has ever been scraped before.
All right, we've got a different type of neck here with a concave shape to it. So I'm going to have to adjust the blade. So forgive me for a second. So I've had to go for a rounded blade and it's going to take longer, but it keeps that concave shape in the neck. Some classical guitars have a concave neck. This, this, I'm loath to say it's close to classical because it's not quite classical, though it's got all the classical makes to it. It's just to play guitar, really. I don't think it's made of the best of stuff. It might be early 60s because of the way the neck was held on with that sort of uh, metal screw. That's a, a special made special metal screw, but you can see the engineering of the screw was early 60s. So, but I like to know what the kind of good mix make I'm working on. Uh, the other guitar that I'm getting very shortly is a guitar the guy bought off the internet. And he bought it off a chappy who didn't know what make a guitar it was. And he doesn't know what make a guitar it is. It's like a, a Gibson E. It's like a Gibson uh, E6, is it? I forget now. Numbers and me don't go too well together. Even though it's spreadsheets was my main daily job. But remembering numbers is no good because my brain's been pickled over the years with so many spreadsheets. Anyway, why would you want to remember? I used to be able to remember every single car registration number that I of the cars I owned, and I thought to myself, why? <laughs> what kind of useless? That's just clogging up my brain with useless information, you know. So I just said, well, why should I bother? <laughs> every time I go to tax my own car now, I have to go look out the window and find out what the registration number is. <laughs> That's how bad it is. I don't care. I don't care to remember it. I remember being stopped by the police. When I was very young, I was stopped by the police. I was about 18. And the policeman said, come to the front of the car. So I walked to the front of the car. He was a fairly nice policeman. You know, he wasn't being nasty. And he just says, come to the front of the car. And because I was young and I was dressed all in black, which was my way in those days, he must have had a sort of suspicion that maybe the car wasn't mine. So he, he says to me, uh, I was standing at the front of the car in front of the bonnet, and he says to me, right, what's your registration number? He was testing me to see if I knew the registration number. And I bent down and looked at it and said, blah, 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 blah. And he laughed. He obviously knew that I was an idiot from Canada and didn't have a clue what I was talking about. And he, he actually laughed out loud. He says, you weren't supposed to look at your registration number. You were supposed to tell me you knew it, you know. And then I laughed too, but I, 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 he let me go on, but I had to laugh. Me bending down, he wanted to test me to see if I knew it. <laughs> I knew all right when I bent down and looked at it. <laughs> ah, yes. So it just shows you, even in those days, I wasn't that much interested in car registration numbers. Today, what time is it? five o'clock there's some big match on England's going to win world glory again somewhere and I'm not a football person and yes 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 I do hope they win because it unite the country after Brexit and they'll unite the country after Covid and you know, all that sort of thing but really football to me died in the late 70s maybe early 80s when we had the likes of so we start off with the likes of George Best, was, who was a genius, but then we had the Bobby Bo, Bobby Bobby Moore, and, and then we had the, the 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 age of the Ronaldos and Maradona and all those people. Some of them, some of them were absolute geniuses with the football, Cruyff. But today. I'm sure they're all very good with the football. Soccer ball 
so, sorry Americans if you don't like me calling soccer football but soccer it's it's been so homogenized if you can't you can't get rough at all you know you have to be so gentle and polite and all that and but soccer's not that so, soccer like all sports it's a game of competition it's a war really you know and i don't want people to get killed on the field but i do remember when i played football in the 60s it was rough and tumble and the rules weren't you know if you oh, oh he pulled my hair oh dear i'm all upset you know and that, that's and you see if somebody faked a foul in my day his own team would probably punch him in the face and say don't do that that's bad sportsmanship but nowadays it's it's an it's an art i think it became an art when Mar maradona fouled put that goal in and beat the english team by using his hand to put the goal in and he didn't declare it now would i have declared it yes i probably would have because i'm an idiot but he didn't declare it and he let it go and he let that that's cheating you know, and it doesn't matter anymore. It's, uh, anyway, you look at some of the, it's a pity George Best didn't last longer and he wasn't more popular in, when the, in the days when we had really good cameras and quality cameras to see him, you know, and we had, we didn't have cameras in every match in those days, so we missed a lot of his really good performances. But the guy was a ballet dancer and he was a genius. And we only have some odd color stuff and we have some black and white stuff of his, his movements. Now, we've got a, in Northern Ireland, we, hear, we have a, the, our, 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 my teeth will come in. In Northern Ireland, we have an airport here in our main Belfast city and it's called the George Best Airport. Yeah, that's all well and good tribute to his sportsmanships, but he wasn't the nicest person in his private life. And I, I know we blame, we excuse alcohol and stuff like that there, but you know, I met George on a couple of occasions. I had dinner with him. Nice guy, bonhomie, lovely guy. I met An Angie, his wife, and she was beautiful. And I, I thought she was gorgeous. And George was the nicest chap, but he was, he was all George, you know what I mean? I suppose, what, what else could you be? But he was all about himself and his football. And I don't, I'm, just, I'm not saying he's arrogant. He was fairly shy and reticent, but the only thing he could talk about was football. And, and I thought maybe it'd be nice to talk to him about something else, but it just didn't. And of course, during the night, he got a few drinks and, and a bit more loud, a bit more aggressive. And he told a story about being in the hotel room with Miss World. He told it in front of Angie, which I felt a little bit uncomfortable with. But she seemed to be okay because she sort of says to herself, well, he's this personality and he tells these stories. You know the old story I'm talking about, about... The, him lying in bed with Miss World and all these thousands of pounds lying through the screw, strewn, strewn across the bed, and uh, the waiter or the room manager came in and says, well, "Where did it all go wrong, Mister Best? You know, did it happen?" Mm -hmm. It's a good story, but he was a womanizer, couldn't keep his hands off women, and. Angie was a delightful girl. She was the sweetest girl, but she was a womanizer. Couldn't couldn't resist. And in the end, when he got a new kidney, swore to be n n not to, not to drink anymore. And somebody could have had that kidney who could still be alive today, but he was given a kidney of priority over others, and uh, he got his kidney lasted a few years without drinking and then fell back into the disease again. I know it's a disease. But the end, then he ended up with leaving Angie and going living with this less than Angie-like person. Let me put it like that. And I thought, George, she doesn't look anything 
in the same quality as Angie and you just left your wife for something else and it wasn't else it wasn't what I would call a move upwards as they say in Northern Ireland no harm to the girl but he ended up dying and drunk and his liver his kidneys gave out of the liver or his kidney I forget what it was liver or kidney trouble he had and I suppose maybe I'm too much of a purist because I like our heroes to to be heroes all round, but I suppose there's not many of them around. We look at Americans' heroes, John F. Kennedy. God, he was terrible. He was just a sex fanatic, you know, and we don't really know what happened to Marilyn Monroe. We do know that he had a, an affair with her, but... Marta Monroe was a very vulnerable person, you know, but that was all hushed up. And it's not just a rumour. His own bodyguards came out and said he was an awful person for sex. He was having sex in the White House pool one day with a girl and suddenly Jackie Kennedy came along and the, the, the bodyguards ran to get John Kennedy out of the pool with his girlfriend and just made it. You know, and it's not just a rumor. It it was, it was it was verified by several of the bodyguards after John Kennedy. A, a long time after John Kennedy, but they they wouldn't want to release that stuff when he was assassinated. You know, but they did. But I went to Manchester Business School. And Manchester Business School is one of these schools for people who are going to make it in life. They're going to be managing directors. They're going to be bank managers and stuff like that there. And I took a course in Manchester Business School. I was sent there by Ledu. And one of the questions they asked me and the class, what's your sex life like? You know, and, and I thought, what the hell? This is in the 80s, you know. So uh, it turns out that they judge the aggression of a person by his uh, libido. So if you have a very active libido and you're very, uh, very much in need of sex all the time, apparently that makes you a, a killer instinct and you'd be good at business. Well, I was pretty good at business and <laughs> I think I had a fairly normal libido, you know, but uh, I think I was too too kind in business for some some of these killer instincts where they just wipe people. You know, you've seen it on The Apprentice and things like that there. Just killer instinct, destroy. That was never me. That was never me. I managed a lot of factories, a lot of companies. I managed a lot of factories and companies across England and I always felt that it was better being nice to people than, than having, making them live in fear to do their work. Yeah, you know, you're going to be sacked if you don't do this and all that sort of stuff. That was never, never my way and uh, would never have been my way. I think that's a disgusting way to work, you know, playing people off each other is another way to do it. But not my way thank you and the very first factory I managed from my chief executive he used to buy factories that were in trouble and then he used to send me in to say awesome well, see what you can do to get that fixed up and he would send me in as managing director boy I could tell you stories the very first one he sent me to And it was owned by uh, the Hartley Bird Company, and my chief executive was the director in Hartley Bird. So they bought up this old factory, and they sent me up to it in Romford. And when I first went there, there was a golden Rolls Royce outside the front door. And I thought, well, what's that? The factory itself was rather run down. So I went inside, and I met the, the man who used to own it. Uh, I'm not name him. 
but he was the owner of the Golden Rolls Royce and he had an, a fact, it was a two floor factory and upstairs was the office for him. Big massive office, all mahogany, drinks, cabinets and everything like that there. And then I went down to see the men and he didn't like me much because I was taking over from him and he didn't like me much. He made it quite clear he didn't like me much and I didn't particularly like him. And I was proven to be right in my not liking of him. But I went down to see the factory floor and I swear it was like stepping back into Victorian times. The workers were dressed literally in rags. They were rags of a uniform that must have been from the 50s. It was that sort of muddy colour and been, they'd been all patched. The, the place was stinking dirty with piles and piles of metal shavings because they were an industrial factory that used rooting machines and stuff like that there. And the lights were actually light bulbs over a, over their workspace, just, just an ordinary incandescent bulb. Wherever they worked, they had an incandescent bulb in it. And it really was dark and miserable and awful. So the first thing I did is I had a, a meeting in the factory. I asked everybody to come together. And they all came about, about 40 of them. It wasn't a huge factory. And I says, from tomorrow, I want you to start half an hour later. Come in at the normal time, but don't start your work for half an hour. And when you go home at night, I want you to go home. I want you to stop work 15 minutes before you go home. And then during that half an hour in the morning, I want you to clean up and get yourselves organized. And at night time, I want you to spend that 15 minutes cleaning up and getting organized for the next day. Oh, and the horror that they thought, we'll go bankrupt, we'll go bankrupt, we'll go bankrupt. But within two weeks, production rose by 5%. Now, the old managing director was ripping with me and he left that day in a huff, took his Rolls Royce and drove off. And when I went in the next morning, the, the, the foreman came up to me and says, you know that uh, Mr. Such and Such was here this morning at seven? I said, no. He says he took his Rolls Royce around to the back of the factory and he loaded all the pure silver into the boot of it. And uh, when I say pure silver, we made parts for submarines that had them made out of pure silver because they, well, almost pure silver because you couldn't have sparks in a submarine. That was one of our things. So we had about seven or 8,000 pounds of pure silver, which we would shape into the shape of the part we were making. And he loaded it all into the boot of his car and took off and we never saw him again. But I just rang up the uh, chief executive and said to him, listen, uh, Mr. Such and Such has just taken all the silver. Oh, he says, has he now? Give me a price of what it was. And so we got a price, it was around six or seven thousand pounds. He says, oh, that's interesting. He says, thanks for telling me that. He says, we haven't given him this final check yet for the factory. We'll make sure it's deducted. <laughs> so I love that. You know, and uh, he didn't get away with what he wanted to get away. But he lived like the, the greedy old capitalists of, the, of what you imagine in the days of greed when you read the stories. Living in a mahogany office up on the top floor and coming down to see the men sometimes rarely. Actually, I had, when he left, I took over his office and I called the whole factory up to the office to have a meeting just to say, look, new management, new management, everything's going to be changed and we're, we're thinking brighter days ahead, blah, blah, blah. And, do you know, some of them said, we've been here 23 years and we've never set foot in this office. And I just thought to myself, imagine never letting your, your, your slaves into your workplace. Uh, just, I just thought that his, 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 uh, he would be the killer type of person that uh, the Manchester Business School were looking for. He would be the kind that would be, you know, all oh, right, hey, this is the type of man we need. But to me, it was just, well, I'm not going to say what I think of him. I think you can imagine what I think of him. Right, okay. Now, how long have we got on this video? 
Now what I'm going to do is just scrape along here just to get the dust out. I could tell you more and more stories about that factory. Bought them brand new uniforms, bright blue. Took three weeks to come. Not gaudy bright blue, but royal bright blue with the patch of the name of the factory on the, 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 on the, the, the thing and they look very smart. And so on the day they arrived, I went out with them all on a big trolley and I called the whole room. I said, everybody, you got your new uniforms are here and everybody sort of went away, cheer and all that sort of thing. And uh, let me just check this because I turned this around. And I started to hand them out, you know, and make a joke every time. It, but in the background, I could see three ladies, three older ladies, and you could see they were upset. And eventually, they you could see they stormed out the back door. And I turned to the foreman. I says, "What's wrong there? The, 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 what's happened there?" And he says to me, "They've been giving out the uniforms for twenty years, and they think that now you did it." that they're no longer needed, so they're away in a huff. And so they went home. So I got the man, the foreman, let me just clean that up. I got the foreman to go and visit them because it wasn't the days of mobile phones where you could ring them and tell them to come in tomorrow morning and not to leave, but to come and see me. And I groveled and I said, I'm so sorry, I didn't know the traditions here, nothing at all, we couldn't do without you. And uh, they were all happy at that. The thing is, though, that they were in, they were in this kind of a medieval type workplace where that was their job. And so you can understand why they got all upset when this smart ass in a suit came in and uh, started changing things and just took over their job. So you can just understand that. But I tell you, from then onwards, those three ladies and that workforce, I don't think I actually, during my time there, I was only there a year because I had to move on to another place. But I actually, no, I don't think I did. I didn't sack one person in that, that year. They all were great workers and very intelligent people. Uh, but I left because my managing director could not stop tinkering. And he kept tinkering and tinkering and tinkering with the processes. So I says, and listen, you get you do it yourself then. And so I went off and started my own business and left my managing director. That was the last factory I did for him after a, about 10 years I worked for him. But he just couldn't. He got more and more confident. Every time I'd turn a factory around, he'd come in and start playing with it and screwing things up. So I just thought, right, I made him enough money. It's time I made some money for myself. But he wasn't happy. He wasn't happy. He wasn't happy at all. So there you are. That's the neck cleaned up and oiled. I'm going to give it a lot of oil in the next 24 hours. But that's a neck scraping. And the next thing I'll do is... I'm going to switch the camera off to let... Give a few more of those. Come back on and polish the frets and set them. Okay? Ciao. I suppose I should tell you. Uh, I'm too busy talking, reminiscing about the past. If you notice, it's dark in there, like there's dirt and darkness in there. And you'd be quite right to notice the dirt and darkness in there. But the wood has gone so soft, I don't want to scrape so hard in there to take that out because you'd undermine the frets because it's just so soft underneath the frets there. I'd rather have that little dark line down the side of the frets than to damage it anymore. You can see that in actual fact, I, I can't zoom up here, but you can see there that that's all chopped away and dry and has been, it's gone over the years. So I've seen it happening in frets before. You take too much of that away or you scrape too close to the fret and you actually undermine the fret. So just that I'd explain that. There's a good example of what I was trying to tell you that sometime in the past that's been undermined and your best dog sleeping lie because that can pop up if you play with it too much. I have my air fryer going on and it smells like something burning but it's not, can't be. So 
I have polished the frets and I have dried up the fretboard a little bit, taken off the uh, the oil a little bit, so it's all. Theoretically, I would let it go at this stage, but I don't like the look of it with the dark edges beside it. So I'm going to try something uh, to see if it works. I'm going to put some dark stain on it. And no reason why it shouldn't work, but it depends on what the wood's like. I'm going to put some dark stain on it to see if that will make it look a little bit better. Oh, racist, racist, blacking up. Everything's feckin' racist. And I said fecking, not feck, feck, fecking. Right, okay, bye, bye Look what you made me do. You people in YouTube land. There was a burning smell. It was my... I could have, I should, should have been paying attention. I had peppers on the boil and I forgot about them. <coughs> So much for my smoke alarm. Look at that there. Look at that there. I forgot to show you. That's the body tidied up and kneaded it. Kneaded it compared to. I'll show. I'll show you a comparison. But that's the body and that's the neck. I forgot to show you the neck too. So I'll. I'll, I'll reverse. I'll put this video before. <laughs> now I just have to do the head and polish the sides a bit but it's looking a lot better from the uh, previous have a look at wherever i'm going to put the photograph all right so can you see that better now you can right that is the bolt that's holding it on to the inside of the guitar and it's an imperial measurement bolt sorry yes bolt that's the bolt believe it or not that's the bolt Right, and it's clever enough design. It grabs onto the edges and doesn't let it turn when you're turning it. But if you look closely at it, you'll see that there's a lot of wobble. Let me just do that. There's a lot of wobble, which means it'll never tighten and it's just about ready to strip. The other problem with it is it's got a square tightener, which I hope you can see there, right? Now that means you can't get tightening it as well as you want to. So I'm going to, I wanted to keep it original, but what I'll do is I'll put it in a little plastic bag and I'll tape it underneath or do something and or give it to the owner. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, the, the bar with a thread on it, and I've got self-locking nut at that end with a large washer, which will go on the inside. And I'm going to do the same on the outside. The only thing that I am concerned about is this wood. Hopefully you're in focus. So I'm, I'm, I'm in two minds now whether to put the washer inside or a, a larger washer on the outside. And I must admit I'm leaning towards a larger washer on the outside about there, which will give more of the radius of the wood to take the pressure. Can you see that? The larger washer on the outside. I may have to bend that washer to make it sort of shape to the... Well, I know I will have to bend it. What do you mean I may have to bend it? Austin, I'm going to bend that washer to fit the radius a bit better. And that would give more of a area for the pressure. So next time you see it, I should have it all together in that fashion, but not tightened up. Okay, now here we are again. Happy as can be. All good friends and jolly good company. Oh, yes. All right, okay. So the bolt, can you see, is through. The washer has been bent uh, to shape like that there. And there's a washer, flat washer on the inside and a self-locking nut on the inside. And now I'm going to tighten it up. Uh, for the first time, no doubt it will be needing to be tightened. I have my trusty tool here, or is it a rusty tool?
Right, and what have we got? Yes, it's down a bit further than it should be. So it needs to come up that way, and what, what we need to do to do that. Right, okay, well, we'll work on that next. As you can see from the tuners, they've been replaced at some stage, and there's a sh they were uh, in, in they were the 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 previous the previous tuners were in row and they were uh, uh, countersunk. These are better tuners, and they've been um, put on separately. They haven't been put on particularly well because the. I don't know whether you can see that or not because the bars are at different angles, but they're working. So I'm not going to uh, do anything with the tuners because they're all feel okay and they're better tuners than probably what was on originally. Uh, I'm just going to give this neck a clean up and I see a little bit of damage to the back and the inside there. All I'm going to do is stain it and uh, give it a, a, a bit of a stain and a clean just to take away some of the ugliness there. Just when I thought my fingers were sort of becoming back to normal again, I'm going to get them doity again. Or am I? This is a little bit of uh, just a tiny touch of white spirit. God, my head. It's the fourth, it's July the 12th here in Northern Ireland. And that is the marching season, they call it. Uh, and, and, and don't believe all you hear about the marching season. It isn't a bunch of uh, bigoted Protestants out uh, making themselves more superior than they are or whatever. It is a celebration, and it always was, a celebration of a battle that took place in 1690, well actually 1689, 1690. And that battle, deter that battle was won probably was the pivotal, it wasn't that great a battle, but it was a pivotal moment in English history, British history, because at that stage, the Pope and the Catholic King James wanted to take over the whole of the UK, and he wanted to invade through Ireland. And he came to Northern Ireland, and there was a large battle fought, and he was defeated. Now, had he won the battle, the Southern Ireland, the whole of Ireland would have been then occupied by foreign troops trying to take England, and that would have been a sort of battle from the backside. And so England would have had a real struggle to survive that. So the fact that the, the battle was beat King James meant that England was on its road towards where it became years later with Henry VIII and Henry VIII uh, uh, he did unwittingly unwittingly I must say uh, allowed the kingdom to become a Protestant nation in similar lines to uh, the Duke of Orange uh, in the, the the UK, the Lutheran, you know, the Lutheran. Now, King Henry, uh, Henry VIII was a devout Catholic all his life, but it was actually Oliver Cromwell that did the most, uh, Cardinal Wolsey and Oliver Cromwell that did the most to move it towards a, a they didn't call it uh, Protestant in those days, they called it Evangelicals, or they called it... Uh, but Henry VIII was burning people on the stake for being too Catholic because he didn't like the Pope. He wanted to have a Catholic reign in, in the UK of his own. But he was burning Catholics on the stake for being too Catholic and pledging allegiance to the Pope. And he was burning Protestants uh, uh, because they were heretics and didn't believe in the true religion, which he was made keen of. Now, it was... Uh, it was Cromwell in the background was closing all the monasteries, the Catholic monasteries, and with the, with the uh, acquiescence of King Henry VIII, because Henry VIII was making a pile of money by closing the monasteries and taking all their wealth, and uh, I think Cromwell was hung, executed. I think his head was chopped off. Yeah, 
I think because he fell out of favour with the Keen, because I think the Keen discovered what Cromwell was doing, and also Cromwell was getting a little bit big for his boots and was bragging about some of the things he was doing, and the Keen didn't like that. And the Henry the Eighth was a very neurotic Keen, and uh, if you upset him, your head was on the block. Uh, but that's sort of why the orange men over here celebrate that still and and also you have to bear in mind that this troubles that we have in Northern Ireland haven't been going on just since the 1960s there has been a constant attack on the British people in Northern Ireland for hundreds of years and yes the British people or should I say the Protestant people in Northern Ireland, the Unionist people, did have treat Catholics right up until the 60s like second class citizens. But you must not put yourself in the, in the shoes of someone who lived before the 60s because you, even then they were taking people the IRA and those people who used the excuse of United Ireland were taking ambassadors and murdering their whole family and killing people for for over 200 years. So it's not just a, a straightforward case of uh, Protestants treating Catholics badly because they were uh, dominant Protestants. It was because they feared what would happen if they let the Catholic population reach ascendancy because there was a lot of terrorism going on even then. Second World War, the, uh, the IRA were threatening uh, the, uh, the English to attack and do damage and uh, they aligned themselves in a small way with the with the Axis forces because they hated the British so much. So there was a, a nervousness amongst the Unionist and populist population to allow Catholics to become dominant because there was that problem. Now, the IRA failed, even though we're now living in a weirdest democracy ever seen, the IRA failed because even during the height of the IRA troubles, the Catholics and Protestants in this country were not at each other's throat, which is what the IRA wanted. And I must admit, some of the some of the uh, the loyalist unionists wanted that too, but a very small minority. Generally speaking, the loyalists wanted to remain British, but uh, they both were stupid enough to commit murders on each side, and so people around the world says, "Oh, they're both as bad as each other." Mm. Well. In some instances they were, but that's a very short nutshell of the of the Northern Ireland uh, issues. <laughs> and I, I got a feeling that there's an awful lot more to it that I could probably tell you, but you'd be bored to tears. And I do come from a British perspective, because I'm British. And that's why the 12th of July they march. It's also a, a protest against the way that they have been treated over the years and uh, they're protesting against the, the, the Orange Order got more and more popular as the IRA killed more and more people and murdered more people and so it became sort of like a protest against the IRA and the killers so that's how that's there's the history of Ireland in one little shot what do you think of that now I'm going to put some strings on I'm not going to do any more than that right strings on well, there you go. That's it going back to its daddy now. I'm just going to check its tuning. I suspect it'll be back again because it needs... It needs to settle in with all the things I've done to it. Although it may not be back again. That's it roughly in tune. I'm not a... This is a classical guitar. Well, it's a mini sort of classical guitar. Uh, that's the head just tidied up. 
haven't cut the strings yet. Uh, I left the strings at the very end because they're nylon strings. And as you can see, the back is looking good. And the front's looking a lot better than what it was. Nylon strings on, fretboard, oh, fretboard doing well. So, and I'm not a classical guitar player, so it sounds okay. okay it looks okay it plays okay it's gonna need adjusted a couple more times you see the nut there it's got a self-locking nut on the inside and left left and if you want the neck the in, the interesting thing will be interesting to see is over time because when I tightened the neck up the strings went completely flat when I loosened them off it came off to the perfect so if I pull that back hard now it'll go flat to the neck but the string tension should always keep it about where I like it. And as you can see, the action is excellent up there at that end. Uh, but I suspect it'll be played mostly down at that end. Hard to keep it in tune with brand new nylon strings on. There you go, it's going home now, it's going home. Could paint that black, but I don't think you need to. I think it's fine. All right, it's going home to its mommy or daddy or or it's actually a little boy. It's going to be playing it. All right, bye.